Uh, the topic for final and seventh session is driving ESG initiatives forward. I would like to call upon moderator for the session, Mr. Nirupam Shrivastav, Vice President, Strategy and AI, Hero Corporate. Mr. Sonal Verma, Partner, Dheer and Dheer. Ms. Avisha Gupta, Partner, LN and Partners. Ms. Suhana Islam Murshid, Partner, Khaitan and Company. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, we have the last session, uh, and uh, this session is on ESG. And this, before I start this session, uh, I would like to reiterate that this session is not for the panelists here, actually this session is for the audience. So the panelists will be asking the questions and you would be answering those questions. So uh, I hope you guys are ready with it. Okay. So let's start with the first exercise. So I would request each one of you to take your mobile phones out in case they are not out. If they are out, just take it in your hand. So, I hope you guys are doing it, because I'm going to ask a question. Yeah, yeah you, you also please, yeah, yeah. So, on your main screen, lock screen, how many of you have the weather coming on the screen? If you can raise your hand. You have weather coming? Okay, great. Or if not on the lock screen, you can go to the home screen. Yeah, thanks, Pramita. So, just go to, yeah. So a couple of people have weather coming in on there. Uh, what about other guys? No weather app, no weather something? Okay. If you do not have a weather app or weather coming on your home screen, you definitely would have a Google search bar on your home screen. Just type weather in it. So let me do it with you in case those who don't have it. Just type weather and press search on the Google. So Google will show your weather and uh, now this is the question. So who wants to first go? Uh, who can see the weather on his mobile phone? Raise your hand. So those who can't see, we will help them with this app. So in case your neighbors can't see the weather on their mobile phones, please help them. So all of you can see? Okay, so let me ask uh, the middle table there the in the second row what's the weather right now can somebody get a mic there please your yeah, second table uh, anybody of the out of four the, the four people sitting there yeah just get in the mic there okay somebody else wants to hijack the mic so no problem so you <laughs> They're like elderly bird, yes. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, 38 degrees Celsius. 38 degrees Celsius. Is everybody else getting the same or somebody else getting something different? Uh, anybody who else is getting a different rating? 34. 38. 37. Okay. And what about the, the air index, air quality? What are you getting? 241 poor. 241 poor. Okay. And how with 34, 35, 38, 37, that's what we are getting. How many of us are dressed according to this temperature? None, None right? We are all dressed according to temperature of 22, 20, not 40, just 34, 38. So are we contributing to the greenhouse gases? Because, because of us, the air conditioning has to actually work more, burn more carbon, release more emissions. And we also have to, again, wear an extra cloth for ourselves. So that's where the question of ESG, you know, it's, it's not about just a corporate reporting. It's about what we do in our daily lives, in our daily behaviors. 
So ESG again, this was just an exercise to see each of us see what the quality of air is, what the temperature we are in, and obviously temperatures are high in Delhi right now. We are in summer. But focus, let's come back to the topics here and we have a great panel uh, of all law firms. So the good part is that they have worked with many, many clients and then they can share different uh, aspects of what they have been doing. So let me start and also feel free, any of you have a question in the middle, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and I will take your question and we will uh, come to the panel with that question. So first let's understand what each of us are doing here in the space of ESG. Uh, and uh, let me start, uh, Avisha, with you. Uh, uh, what are you and your firm doing in the space of ESG and what does it mean? So I'll start with uh, what the firm has been doing at uh, uh, the ESG space. So ESG lies at the core of values for the firm uh, at all levels, I would say, at uh, individual councils level at uh, the firm's level in terms of firm's own uh, practices and the ways that uh, it conducts its uh, work and uh, also at uh, at the ESG practice level where we advise clients uh, on matters uh, relating to these aspects. Uh, at an individual or a policy level of the firm, um, you know, we've made sure that uh, there are enough and more uh, safeguards on a day-to-day -day level that, that we are taking to ensure that uh, there's more and more compliance with uh, ESG and we are doing our bit to contribute uh, to the changes that have been happening which are becoming so important right now. Um, at a firm level, we've, we're planning to institute a policy of ensuring, uh, you know, as simple as ensuring that all councils take pooled vehicles to come or encouraging uh, electric vehicles for uh, employees. So simple steps like that at a day-to-day -day level is something that we've been inculcating as a matter of practice amongst all, uh, not just councils, but uh, of councils, all other uh, uh, people engaged with the firm. Uh, at an ESG uh, practice level, uh, or, or for first I would say at Mr. Luthra's level or at the, at the firm's uh, contribution level, we've um, done various projects, not just uh, in terms of advising clients, but also doing our bit in terms of partnering with the right people. Uh, we've developed the Pani Foundation, that's, that's a landmark watershed management project in Maharashtra. Uh, that has brought uh, several billion liters of uh, water storage for several villages. Um, so that's the sort of uh, uh, initiative that we've taken at a more, uh, uh, not just advising clients space, but also doing our bit from the firm standpoint. Uh, third, of course, in, in the workspace, we have a dedicated ESG practice. Um, uh, we work with several clients in this space and we uh, advise them on, even advise our regular clients on on these aspects without without being uh, always necessarily prompted to do so. So that that's how I would sum up our contribution. Wonderful. Thanks, Avisha. So let me come to Suhana uh, from Khetan and Company. So Suhana, what you guys have been doing in ESG space? Uh, so um, again, ESG uh, to our firm is also of key and of uh, key importance. Uh, we have been um, at it and looking into this space since over three years now. So even before this whole BRSR and the conversation starters started, uh, we were looking at it very keenly. Again, at a uh, firm level, um, our practice, uh, because the ESG is such an esoteric subject. So the way we approach it is that we pull in um, partners who are experts in all the fields. So we have uh, partners who are specialized in environmental laws or social ELB practice, as well as funds, green debt, etc., and governance. And we have a core ESG team, which is a national team. Um, in terms of work, we have, uh, you know, we do several kinds of work, starting from policy advocacy, uh, advocacy at the board level. Uh, we 
try and bring in an ESG lens into everything we do, into our transactions, into m &A transactions, doing ESG specific diligences, for example. Uh, we have a very robust um, new age practice groups, for example, electric vehicles, um, uh, etc. Uh, we look into energy related aspects. And uh, we also provide, uh, you know, the whole end-to-end -end sort of services when it comes to reporting. So I think that should sum up uh, what we are doing at present at ESG. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so over to you, Sonal. Uh, you, you have been scaring a lot of clients with esoteric terms. So, uh, so from Sonal, from Dheeran Dheer, please elaborate what you have. Uh, in your firm has been doing in the ESG space. Hi everyone, good evening. And I know we are very, uh, the bar looks uh, to be set up uh, all in time and we are in uh, between of it. And uh, on ESG, uh, as a firm at Dheer and Dheer Associates, we put up the first dedicated practice desk amongst law firms. And the purpose was clear that India to become a 5 trillion or a 10 trillion economy, the major investments will be coming from outside India. And they would be tied up, again, as you said, some terminologies, they would be, the investors would be a part of maybe a UNPRI or a carbon disclosure project or the GSA Alliance. And it would be startling to see how many what amount of assets are being pledged. For example, on carbon disclosure projects itself, US economy is $19.5 trillion, around that. But that one association of investors itself, or any of the groups which I talked about, at least have assets pledged under management in those schemes worth $35 trillion huge money riding and the globes did see from 2008 meltdown time capitalism is starting to move towards impact capitalism and 2018 onwards when mca started maybe the field trips to see how india could align to the global investment ideology esg became a very important thing COVID did hit us and now we have got these thousand listed companies to be reporting on a whole new, the template itself is 35 pages. So we can imagine how big the report would be. So we started the journey and the journey, I think, thanks to the India INC has been very, very encouraging to run that dedicated practice desk. And starting with uh, any company, today ESG altogether gets a uh, first thing is is it a compliance we need to do sorry by making a esg policy the purpose gets defeated it's a philosophy change so yeah a esg charter can start the journey with the board approval definitely every board is today googling on esg trying to see who are the different stakeholders in it? What do they want from us? Because every possible independent director out is talking on ESG. We saw some news hitting us uh, about Elon Musk being very angry on ESG last week because his company was thrown out of the S&P index on ESG. It was a call taken fine on environmental parameters going fine, but on the social parameters, the working conditions at the factories were not keeping up to the ESG parameters. So first thing for everyone out here and all the clients we work in, their annual reports we work into, setting up frameworks which can take maybe right, anything from six months to maybe 36 months, depending on their maturity curve, like the biggest challenge, the first challenge we face is, okay, greenhouse gas emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three. What calculator do you use? Is that calculator going to survive the test of time? You go to Google, type in GHG calculator, maybe 500 calculators come in. 
but those calculations will it configure to UN protocols don't know is what the best answer I hear many a times and each of the companies in India have done something about sustainability it's not a new idea but that balancing between E S and G environmental social and governance parameters is something anew a whole concept maybe when I talk we talk about responsible sourcing electrical company I work for okay tungsten wires being used is that tungsten wire coming from the Congo Republic which is on the sanction list of most of the countries by using it I might go in non-compliance to my US customers who have to follow the Mineral Conflicts Act. So there's lots of intertwining around the whole concept of ESG and it cannot be a lopsided environmental project. So the right balancing is very much needed and I think like um, in any of these situations one size doesn't fit all. So depending on the industry what are their risk factors tech companies would have different manufacturing heavy manufacturing would have different like a two-wheeler company would have different uh, requirements what are the global standards so it's not only laws but the global standards play it's an interesting i think for everyone around and esg is there to stay not only because of laws it will be because of your investors, your employees, your third party supply chain, your reputation and business continuity. And lawyers, GC sitting out here and everyone, we in the whole ecosystem will be the key drivers because no one understands these rule books or can decode rule books, put up the right disclosures and uh, keep our stakeholders well informed and continue the journey. That was a quick wrap up. If I can just add, I think yeah. you made a very good point and I just wanted to add on it. I think most people, you know, clients who are just getting into or understanding ESG would consider it, like he mentioned, a lopsided environmental project. But there is equal emphasis because these are all non-financial parameters, right, to evaluate your your business and your uh, uh, your revenues so um, there is equal importance that needs to be given to the s aspect which is the just transition part of it as well as governance so um, yeah, i think that's a very good point and something as i would say as a firm we have got lots of things over years over decades we have been into the indian market Lately, I think a couple of very interesting initiatives we took in was to get, uh, you say, interns who are from economically backward category, have a specific program for interns coming from LGBTQIA. So the inclusion part being worked upon in a very conscious manner. And uh, next week, we doing this last year, we did that ESG research lab have law students come in 24 hours we set out with them in a virtual environment saving carbon footprints do some interesting projects around esg and it's interesting celebrating the world environment day so again very interesting comments uh, uh, we should talked about the projects uh, water conservation uh, suana so talked about the different uh, multifunctional partners that are required to come to an ESG kind of a matrix as well as the S factor and uh, Sonal talked about the global standards in fact you know and uh, what what we can do so going back to the audience uh, those in the audience who actually uh, are doing or have done again those who are on the GC side those who are, who are doing the ESG reporting and those in the law firm side those who are helping those clients uh, do the ESG reporting, please raise your hand and uh, uh, we will come to you. But please, uh, if those of you who are doing ESG reporting for themselves or for their clients, anybody? So we, we don't have really good big takers of ESG in the in the community. But right I'm now. very sure that now the mandatory period on BRSR starting every general council and the in-house team sitting here would be part of the multi-stakeholder committee to get the ESG 
uh, roadmap in place. Okay, so now let me take an easier question and I will not put you on the spot in a way that you have to answer whether you are doing ESG. But uh, how many of you, again by raise of hand, think ESG is an old wine in a new bottle? So we have been doing sustainability, we have been doing governance. ESG is a mixture of sustainability plus governance plus something something on the diversity front. So how many of you think, kindly raise your hand, or you think ESG is something new and transformative? Uh, so those who think it's an old wine in a new bottle. Okay, so all, all people think it's a new transformative stuff because no, yeah, so one lady is there. Uh, please uh, send the mic there. So if you can elaborate on, on, on this uh, uh, judgment, can, if you can stand up, we can see you better then. Oh. So I would say it's just a perspective that we have been uh, seeing governance, uh, CSR, and uh, of course, environment, sustainability, all these elements were there and corporates were uh, looking after all those elements while they were doing a reporting in the annual report or otherwise also. So in a way, I would say it is an old while in a new bottle. Okay. That's what uh, I believe. Yeah, it's a combination of existing factors. That's what you Absolutely. think. Absolutely. Okay, and anybody in the audience who disagrees with her or everybody agrees with her? And, and you can raise your hand and uh, uh, I'm sure after the, this can be a good topic to discuss over drinks as well, but just wanted to, so everybody agrees with you. So that's a great audience, you know, in fact. <laughs> so coming back to us, yeah, speaker, so what do you think? It's an old wine in a new bottle and uh, or is it something different from whatever we have been doing because that was not working, we did this. Uh, what's your view, uh, starting with your vision? So I'll just add a nuance to um, uh, what you said. Uh, it is, you know, the concepts, the baselining, um, the requirements, they have all been there in the place, uh, right? But the way that, uh, that now uh, consumers, investors, uh, founders, GCs, corporates at wide are looking at uh, ESG, that has evolved over time. That has definitely changed. So I wouldn't necessarily say that it's the same thing as before. The concepts, yes, do remain the same, but the way that we look at it on a day-to-day -day basis or the kind of focus that is there on ESG today has vastly changed and grown. So a little bit uh, before going to the history of ESG, a little bit about the term uh, itself. Uh, there was a paper that the, the first time, in fact, the ESG term got coined was, uh, it's an interesting story, it's 2005, not very new, it's back in 2005, uh, where a United Nations paper had a beautiful title called, uh, Who uh, Cares Wins? And that's the first time that this term ESG had um, had been coined and from there on it has only taken up uh, speed. Uh, coming back to, you know, you can term it whatever you want to, sustainability, CSR, um, ESG, of course there are minor differences in understanding between these terms, but keeping those differences aside, uh, at a larger level, I think the initial thought was based long time back, you know, 10, 10 years, 15 years back was based on mere uh, compliance. So it was something that was uh, that was needed to be done uh, because the law mandated us to do so. The laws have also of course evolved and they continue to do so. We have in India at least the environmental laws, we have the labor codes. Um, now for governance we have, SEBI has done uh, a lot in terms of governance, uh, ex executive compensation, disclosure requirements. So laws have uh, been there. But the way that uh, corporates had been looking at ESG compliance was more from a need to do perspective. That over the last, uh, I would say seven to eight years, evolved into um, a good to do strategy because, um, because it was becoming more and more clear that whoever is more compliant on ESG parameters is going to get uh, uh, direct benefit in terms of uh, receiving good funding, receiving consumers interest, and thereby translating indirectly into better financials. So that was the second sort of a phase uh, in my mind that uh, the, the concepts have grown. So from uh, a need to need to do, it became a good to do, 
um, uh, model where uh, because you needed more funding because you needed more uh, attention from the consumers corporates started incorporating or embedding esd values into their uh, business the latest change that i see happening is that it's no longer just a, a need to do or a good to do it's in it, it's become so much more integrated into uh, the culture of a company and i and i see that in in several clients and that's that's a good thing that may not have translated directly into action but at least the thought is there in the right place that these values are more intrinsic now these values are now more understood to be um, inside out driven and not just uh, a good to do strategy and that that also has a practical aspect to it given the uh, given the globally connected world that we live in the supply chains are all uh, global uh, with advancing technology it's impossible to not look at these parameters and be doing business now so from uh, from a need to do need to do to a good to do it's now becoming imperative to inculcate all these values as part of culture so we've moved a long way from mere compliance uh, to culture is is what my thought here I can uh, Suhana, uh, what what are your thoughts? Is it um, something different? Uh, she talked about investing. She talked about uh, cultural change. But what what's your view? Uh, let me let me put a different angle to the same thing. So the way I look at it, what has really evolved over the past decade or so is the concept that a company must have a purpose. It's not enough to make profits. You need to have a purpose. And this goes back to the business roundtable um, conference that was held uh, in America. And there are several books uh, written on this as well. Um, the fact that you need to have a purpose, that you cannot only do and do business to increase your shareholders' wealth, you have to act responsibly for all your stakeholders. I think that has shifted. So now we've come to a stakeholder sort of a, um, a regime, a stakeholder governance kind of a regime, uh, which, you know, then brought out concepts such as uh, double materiality or triple bottom line. And this is all, you know, jargon thrown around. But what it essentially means is that you need financial parameters and you need non-financial parameters to really assess value for your company. And so coming to your question, has anything changed? The laws remain the same. Disclosure regimes are becoming more strengthened as we go on. They're becoming, we are moving to a more transparent ecosystem. Uh, and that is really happening, like Avisha said, because investors are driving it, your stakeholders, customers, suppliers, employees are driving it. Uh, there's a very interesting survey I was reading, I think it was by Bain, and they said that Today's the millennials want to work in companies that have a purpose. They want to think that they are doing good for society. So it's just not enough. The pay scale is itself not enough. So, you know, I think mindset is shifting. It's changing. And uh, so ESG, the laws remain in a nutshell, but the attitude has changed. Sure, great point, Suhana. So, purpose is the key word here. Uh, the companies need to have a purpose beyond just making money. Uh, okay, Sonal, uh, your views. Okay. I have a bit of a different view, Ravesha and Suhana said. Is this is the first time with ESG coming uh, in this big way, uh, affecting every company? It's moving away from that doer compliance. To do a compliance, ESG is not about compliance. It's about a continuous journey for an organization wherein they might pick in a three-year goal, five-year, 10-year goal, a 15-year goal, 20-year goal, a 30-year goal. And that's the biggest shift which is in motion. And if we see uh, Post the, uh, the Paris climate change, the UN Sustainable Development Goals came in. And uh, like India has taken that uh, uh, huge, uh, you say, um, fulfillment parameters till 2030. 
private companies also a part of it for companies in india these uh, global performance benchmark standards never used to matter it's my labor laws my environment laws my licenses in place okay sebi and mca has told me hundreds of things to do done but now the journey is i have to put to my stakeholders and this change started happening in india 2013 when you had your national voluntary guidelines come in for the first time from that early uh, uh, last year decade changes today it is fine laws are one thing but are you aligned to certain philosophies which are endorsed by the global community like we will start seeing in all the annual reports a terminology tcfd in 24 months time task force on climatic financial disclosures it will be a buzzword un sdgs already last i think 24 months many of the companies annual reports we have started seeing referencing to it because it's a given that we, these companies any company operating in india has to be legally compliant but this extra journey push which is able to show the continuity aspect in a company is what esg is driving and pushing the reputation continuity of the business people associated with it the entire ecosystem around so definitely as per me there's lots of catching up for indian companies uh american and european companies are already on a certain uh, standard setting and uh, for example business and human rights as a concept for reporting in indian annual reports very few companies ever took in now we are seeing even on the new brsr business human rights compulsive reporting coming in gri which is one of those archaic bodies which doesn't want to change they got in in last october a business and human rights chapter because they were being ignored by most of the investment community but some of the audience you may have to elaborate the term gri yeah it's global reporting initiative okay so we will have lots of these aspects come in and today that is the issue wherein i said previously it's a multi stakeholder approach right from the ceo heading that committee with the cfo legal head company secretary head sustainability and head hr head environment these seven eight people have to be a part of it to drive and be in that journey so yes interesting times for everyone so sure. thank you sonal great, great point on continuity of business nirpam i would yeah. just like to add to what um, yes yes um, no actually about the purpose point that you brought out Uh, that's that's i think the starting point of any organization's esg journey is redefining the purpose because um i think and it's a very natural thing whenever a business would have started long time back uh, perhaps these things won't have been at the forefront of the purpose so redefining purpose um you know whenever we are advising clients is the first step that Uh, we ask them to do is to think back and redefine the purpose of uh, your business model and incorporate and embed these values in the purpose itself following the purpose of course there are the next uh, steps that come in in identifying the material elements where um, esg frameworks needs to come in and uh, then defining some baseline factors where you one can benchmark their performance against others and um, And then of course setting a target for a for a company itself and then uh, communicating that target and then reaching that target so all those steps follow but um, uh, the starting point uh, like you said uh, remains redefining the purpose great point uh, yeah. so the purpose is again big factor that i think most companies have a statement on purpose but the focus is how it's aligned to the current social Uh, sustainable and uh, it, uh, practices that's that's where the focus comes into play uh, so my next question is going to be around challenges and again i will make this first question open house so that we understand what challenges the audience have been facing 
इन केस दे वर टू स्टार्ट ऑन दिस ई एस जी जर्नी और सस्टेनेबिलिटी और एनवायरमेंट सोशल एंड गवर्नेंस जर्नी वट दे हैव बिन डूइंग एंड इन केस वी हैव सफिशेंट चैलेंजेस देन वी विल मूव डायरेक्टली टू द आंसर्स फ्रॉम द पैनल बट इन केस नॉट देन वी विल कम बैक टू द क्वेश्चन सो एनीबडी इन द ऑडियंस वुड लाइक टू शेयर सम ऑफ द चैलेंजेस Uh, that they think or they have been facing while starting on this journey it could be as simple as the cfo not agreeing to or somebody else in the chain not agreeing to doing this uh, so or if you are doing it how did you achieve that or overcome that challenge you know would be a learning for all of us uh, so uh, anybody in the audience who would like to talk about challenges and you can please raise your hand and we will have a mic uh, close by Uh, so if you do not raise your hand then i will do oh yeah so vijay i become a strict teacher then and i, I cold call but vijay has been so i was just waiting for anyone to raise hand for challenge so i have no i do not have a challenge i have rather another question so while uh, there is no denial i i it may take the discussion into a different at uh, i mean the direction we have time yeah so uh, while there is no denial and there is no doubt and there is no second thought that the environment is important and we need to protect because we have come uh, i mean very far in uh, that the thing but uh, the thought come that how much is too much so uh, like uh, sonal gave an example of elon musk but elon musk is not the uh, uh, only man a lot of business owner are now claiming that esg has become a tool in the hands of investors investment bankers and investors to arm twist the management so uh, how much is true i mean is it really going in that direction where the investment bankers or the pe companies they are arm twisting management and uh, to, to come to terms uh, as per their own uh, likings or it is, uh, yeah no doubt that it is to be followed but how much that is important if you have any thought about that that's a wonderful question and uh, i i will take that and i will let anybody else having any other challenge and then we will take them together but it's a good point whether this so called non financial reporting and the esg and other stuff is being used as a tool to arm twist uh, the management by the investors or the shareholders so yes good very good question actually uh, and any, anybody else having any yeah please yeah i have one additional question uh, given that cost cutting and you know ensuring the working capitals are in order uh, do we foresee that in coming years there will be pressure on the teams managing esg compliances to also cut down on cost and how does that translate into where we want to go visa with the business requirements given the current scenario right okay so great great question uh, this is around the cost cutting piece and the cost cutting is impacting everybody so the question is whether the esg teams will face the cost cutting first uh, uh, great point great question anybody any anybody else having any questions before we go to the panelist and take these okay can i suggest one question i know that will be on top of talent retention anyone has any issues or everyone is happily able to have talent retention in their companies i, I think that's a universal question <laughs> so, so so let's start with uh, the first question which i which shared and which is is it becoming too much so is it uh, the esg or any other framework which is a non financial has an ability to being misused are abused by the investors to arm twist the management or the entrepreneur so is it becoming too much or is it yeah so uh, i'll just in fact you know uh, this question in you know way links up to the challenges question um you know i do agree and i do see the pain uh, when you when you when you say the question uh, that that might be happening and i think one of the reasons that that's happening and is also linked to the question on challenges in context of esg is the lack of uh benchmarks or the lack of standardized uh, mechanisms to determine how much is too much so 
uh, you know, there is just a gradient and there may be several ratings and indexes to uh, compare oneself from the other, but uh, how much uh, would, would ensure compliance and how much would not ensure compliance. So there is so much subjectivity around uh, ESG compliances that this is leading to, perhaps leading to practices like you mentioned. And, uh, you know, more and more, um, I think it, it, it's akin to the ESG development can be seen to be akin to how accounting standards have developed over the years, right? It's only been fine-tuned over the years to come up with the right way of uh, ensuring that whatever people are claiming are claiming to be true. And that can be benchmarked on an objective level to a certain percentage. And that's how one can say how much is too much or how less is too less, right? So I think that's what I expect and hope to come up in the next uh, decade or so, a more standardization at uh, a country level, if not global, because I do understand there are uh, varying economic conditions, varying social conditions, uh, varying governance structures from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So, um, you know, we have to acknowledge that it's difficult to do, uh, to come up with a common standard, but at least uh, for areas that are commonly affected, there needs to be some form of standardization. And that I believe is one of the most important or the key challenges today in the ESG framework also. Sure. Uh, Suhana, you want to add? Yeah, I just, I wanted to address the gentleman's question there. So, um, how much is too much? I don't think we are in a stage, personally, I think this is a very, um, uh, in India at least, the state of affairs is that it is too less at the moment. So, I don't think we've reached a stage where we can say that now it's getting too much. The broader picture that one has to keep in mind is why are we doing it? Why is suddenly non-financial parameters so important? Clearly when, um, you know, and we all saw this in the COP26, etc. The fact that we are global warming is reaching the point that it is. There will be a point where businesses and this planet's existence will be at, you know, risk. So, I don't think it's right to ask how much is too much. We should say how soon can we get there? At least that's because I, Very you know, nice. I am a, uh, quite passionate about this. So sorry for um, saying this, but the point is that we need to take these measures. I don't think um, private equity investors or institutional investors are arm twisting. Um, you know, their clients or their portfolio companies. The idea is to ensure that the journey has started and that we keep to it. We have goals, we set goals and we keep to it because at the end of the day, it is essential for survival. And it's not only environmental, it, it's a whole range of topics. So, um, you know, just like he mentioned, uh, turnover, which is one of the biggest challenges we faced in the last two years. So how do you retain talent? I mean, uh, clearly an organization's, um, you know, uh, profitability will depend on it. Um, so yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we should ask maybe a slightly different question perhaps. So, yeah, sure, sure. So, so you want to add on? Yeah, I would just add upon that, fine, there would be P's and investors trying to push companies, this is not much, others. I think uh, very professionally, professionally, first thing, if I am in your shoes and I have got a P who is uh, creating that nuisance, I would first understand, okay, you are signatory of which alliance? what uh, companies you have invested in and how well they have reported I am, and I have reported it much, much better because this is objective because that's one very clear message I want to put in. ESG is not a uh, vague uh, journey. Numbers are there. There is definitive approach about enhancement, be it on all those 17 SDGs or whatever other uh, you say, as um, Avisha was uh, talking about, there's too much of heterogeneity of standards, but that P would be aligning to some standard. A European one, definitely, they want to definitely see a meta tag of TCFD, Task Force on Climatic Financial Disclosures. An American investor would look for SASB, Sustainability Alliance Board. So perspective is we need to know the origin, 
of them, what they're doing, which alliances they're into, what their other companies uh, have reported in. Like today, uh, with all of you out here, we all are talking about climate change, zero emission. How many of our companies where you are working, have you signed a UN pledge, be it a climate change now pledge or a race to zero pledge? In India, we're still in that discussion, very, very initial discussion stage, what Suhana did talk about. And it's a long journey. And first thing the confusion comes is, uh, okay, uh, like in the very, some people still ask CSR, ESG, all one and the same. For me, then it's no, no, no. Community toilet building is CSR. Building uh, washroom facilities for your own employees will come from the ESG budget. Drinking water. How many companies do a ISO 10,500 series check on that for their own employees? And these are hard hitting self questions which need to be taken care before the reporting and disclosures can be put in public domain. So yeah, we are very early and we would professionally handle those uh, P's who are trying to manhandle the company. So, so, so let me bring my point uh, to uh, which is your question is uh, not just at a company and investor level, but even at a country's level, uh, sustainability can be used and misused if I would use that word as a tool to get your political objectives done so which is being done so this is no no hidden thing you know it is it's very so america us could be outside the kyoto protocol and will not sign it and will be outside this climate change convention but will blame everybody else right so so yes so and again a good point he said you know ask them you know what are they doing in that uh, and i think the second point is uh, essentially around uh, the bs bs bsr Sorry, business uh, uh, responsibility and uh, sustainable yes. reporting. Um, uh, so once we have this data collection started with at least a thousand of the top companies and and more so, and we have uh, some history around that, we will have some neutral benchmarks coming in with that data. Uh, obviously, in initial days, data would also not be very accurate. But as we go mm -hmm. along, uh, people will start questioning those companies which will not have accurate data. So I, I think it's a journey. It, it will take time, uh, like the accounting standards example being given. But the, the fact is that, uh, uh, again, we will come to the big companies versus small company debate also. That, that's another debate which happens in this, that big companies can afford it. And I think which was the second question, and I will now to, go to the second question, is uh, can uh, companies, big companies may be able to afford it, but will say smaller SME segment, I'm slightly twisting your question, I know, but even with the big companies, those who are not very profitable, uh, does that become a challenge to have uh, ESG or CSR and other kind of initiatives? Uh, and how, how can companies and uh, teams overcome that challenge? So any of you want to take that? Now herein, it's a very, very interesting question. Thanks very much for the question. We will see uh, already post COP26 and November last year, uh, the accounting body in US, IFRS has already instituted, you say, draft disclosures which were put in public do domain in April, industry-wise, that what would, would be the changes needed in life cycle assessments for different companies going forward on ESG. So for example, today, I am on an X technology, but for better, uh, for higher energy efficiency, I might start planning for 2027, a capex expenditure. How do I retire my old assets? And how do I provide for additional capex and opex on different aspects? So we will see uh, a huge, I think by December, uh, US would be very passing out these disclosure standards and then very much sure ICI will pick in also in no time with some more Indian uh, parts coming into it. And one thing for sure, we will see that investment in this is not charity. It's a ROI return. Like 
uh, we saw a huge revenue in two wheeler segment come in with the ev two wheelers it's a whole resurrecting a new and getting a whole new industry there's more affinity of millennial customers going for companies who are in that esg journey we will see a roi with lesser talent leaving us so there will be roi much more than what the investments would go for setting up uh, cleaner energy solutions better social and governance processes so it would not be a revenue negative proposition for any company going forward to get on to the esg journey for the next 5 10 20 30 years so that shouldn't be a concern irrespective of the size because customer fold would increase your employees your reputation all of that have a bearing on the revenue uh, so no so, sorry the question was uh, what co cost the so question was that uh, uh, due to the cost pressures can companies afford uh, these kind of initiatives and whether due to cost pressures and layoffs would people in the esg team would be first to go so how how, how to overcome that challenge okay so no i i definitely agree that um, most of these measures are capital intensive if we are moving to say from fossil to what you know some uh, uh, renewable for example these are capital intensive things uh, but again um, i think the view is and there is enough research done on it that uh, you know the long term benefit and profitability uh, has been evident so maybe short term uh, maybe not but definitely there is a long term roi like sonal also mentioned um in terms of cost cutting um again it would go back to if you are in in the msme sector if you are a small player of course most of these things are not mandatory uh, neither is reporting mandatory neither is csr mandatory if you don't uh, you know keep up to those thresholds but again it goes back to how the organization views uh, you know its purpose it its long term vision so uh, i think even on a voluntary level but it is uh, definitely doable sure uh, i would yeah just to add to um, what you said suhana i think you brought out a very important point that uh, definitely it is capital intensive so i don't see this as um, i i genuinely see the question uh, you know that it's a challenge for smaller companies for msmes uh to really do much about this at the first instance so my response to that would really be for us to look at it as a gradient for us to not look at it as a zero or 100 uh the the challenge i do recognize is also on the end that there are no uh, solutions there are no cut to cut solutions so even if one was to uh, or wants to implement esg solutions and have alternate materials having and sourcing those alternate materials would be much costlier right now and there wouldn't be any ready solutions for a for a company whose whose whole and soul focus at that point in time would be to do the business and and not find sustainable alternatives uh, so i think the industry is still evolving on this uh, i hope more and more companies come and take it as a dedicated business to find these alternative um, solutions and make them available at a cheaper price so that the uh, the the efforts and the endeavors on esg front trickle down to these smaller companies also and becomes uh, practicable for them to also uh, do something material till then my personal advice would be to take smaller steps uh, to whatever extent that a company can and even if uh, you know some of these legal requirements are not uh, are not mandatory um you know just taking them as um, as a responsibility uh, individual responsibility as a, a community responsibility in terms of the employees coming together and in terms of a corporate responsibility in all those three levels uh, you know from our own uh, initiative to the extent that we are able to do uh, we must definitely do and that's how we will carry forward this this journey which is still evolving Uh, okay, so let me add uh, my view to this, and I think Sonal started by rightly that uh, there may be projects which are ROI positive. So you don't really have to assume that uh, the ESG projects are 
ROI negative, but of course, uh, you talked about it might be a capital intensive project. So you may have to put money and take the returns over a longer period of time. Uh, what I also see is uh, on the jobs front, let me come directly to the, the key question there, whether the people will lose jobs due to this uh, or due to the cost pressures. So I don't think so because what I have seen, again, I'm talking from experience here, is that uh, when the companies are forced to do anything, whether it's CSR, whether it's ESG, whether it's something else in terms of reporting, it actually creates jobs and lots of jobs get created even if it were as simple job as that of a report writer. So a lot of people actually got a job of writing reports for these companies uh, 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 because the companies were required to now report all these, disclose all these things uh, inside those companies. So in, in fact, your ESG team or your other reporting teams will actually expand. And once you start reporting, you will have to again then substantiate what you are doing. So you will need those project team to do it. Now, so that way, in that sense, uh, we will actually see a bump up in the ESG teams and ESG growth teams because companies would want to report different parameters as they, are com as they have to comply with those requirements and then you can do it. But also to add that ESG is not a perfect state, right? So you don't have to become 100 tomorrow, right? So you continue on your journey as has been mentioned by, so start which are the easier more feasible projects, move to that and then innovate on the other aspects where you see challenges. So a lot of innovation is again happening due to ESG push. So we will see a lot of uh, uh, new roles and new innovations coming in in the companies. Just to take from what you said, uh, you know, interestingly, most of us are corporate lawyers here. At one point of time, even law or, uh, or the legal teams were seen as cost right uh, and it's only in the matter of time that uh, the importance of having a dedicated team having a dedicated uh, focus and attention uh, to to corporate lawyers and understanding what they are saying and incorporating them in their business decisions came about right i think the same trajectory will be with the esg practice also where slowly but gradually people will uh, understand the impact and the importance that they bring and uh, they'll be regarded uh, as corporate law lawyers thankfully are uh, regarded now. Great point actually and uh, again we all have to prove our work to the, our, our companies and our, our clients so so definitely we have to make our pitch ready and this oh, is yes. <laughs> and this is the session for to get your pitch ready ask as many questions as here so that your pitch is better than what it was before you entered this session. So, so there's one thing like the MSME part, which everyone's talking about. Uh, in order to be a part of the global supply chain, which many of the Indian companies are small, big, all of them, they are being asked for disclosures around uh, their ESG journey. Like last year, anyone doing any business with a German company got a form for, okay, they passed a new law on business and human rights in June. So please share your business and human rights policy. If you're not a part of it, like anyone being a part of these, uh, uh, the supply chain of the luxury fashion groups in New York came up with a law in January this year, asking every uh, big retailer above $100 million uh, revenue in New York uh, specifically to do a 50% social mapping of the supply chain. So for being in business, for companies of any nature, they would just need to align their journey. That's that's very true. It's a very good point. In fact, the BRS are also, I think, the stakeholder engagement. There are specific questions on how have you engaged with your supply chain, your stakeholders, and there are metrics to be quantified. So, um, absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Um, so we we actually are overshooting our time, but uh, we are happy to. Uh, take further audience questions before I can take my question. So uh, we have still, you know, a lot of questions pending, but anybody in the audience want to talk about any other aspect of ESG, uh, which they think, you know, uh, our esteemed audience, uh, esteemed panel can uh, take a quick look at, uh, we would be happy to do so. Otherwise, uh, I will move forward with my question. 
Uh, okay, so uh, so let's talk about the ratings part. So a lot of companies are now getting rated on the ESG front. Uh, so so what what do you make of these ratings? Whether companies should participate in these ratings or they are required to, and uh, and what comprise of these ratings? So uh, any of you? Very um, uh, very very good question. Now with the rating thing, a quick update. Sebi did come around around January and February start. A discussion paper on ESG rating, a 20-page uh, document. As many companies in India were displaying ratings from different uh, research companies based out of India or abroad, and there was one company specifically which always gets into trouble. I won't quote it. Okay, they showed a A rating. And 80% of their revenue comes from, or maybe a huge component of revenue comes from tobacco products. So the entire stock markets and uh, SEBI were, okay, something needs to come. Maybe that would have been the rationale. And the paper was up for uh, public input till 10th April. And we should see in few months that rating document come in. But again, with the problem of ESG rating globally, is these are black boxes. No one discloses the criterion or exact data points on which the rating is done, what algorithms being run around them, how is the comparative in the same industry or across industries being worked out. So SEBI is trying to answer some of those questions in putting more objective parameters and trying to put a level playing field that if Indian uh, players are in it, they do not get disadvantaged by foreign players uh, coming in it. It might lead to a story what happened with the credit rating agencies when they came in and there was a global partner and I think other than one of them, all of them run on the uh, global algorithms. So let's just wait for the final document to come in and see how to treat the ratings. As of now, today in India, any, comp any research company into ESG can give you a rating. And that's good enough as a rating of the other company. Uh, so uh, again, great, great point, uh, Sonal. So uh, we talked about ratings. We talked about what ESG is, what um, is it something new? Is it something different? Why it's relevant? The question around purpose. Uh, we discussed actually a lot of uh, then question on how much is too much and then how to do it, whether it's uh, financially feasible, ROI. So we discussed a lot of tough questions around uh, ESG and I told my panelists that I'm not going to go with the easy questions. I'm going to take the tough questions and thank you audience for bringing two of those very tough questions. So. Uh, in case there are any further questions, we are happy to take. Otherwise, I think uh, we would like to enjoy our drinks. And I'm sure there's some panel after this. One. Okay, there's a panel. Sorry yeah, for that. So I please wait. So. <laughs> please wait. <laughs> Don't break it. You guys I wait. Is out there. <laughs> we, we will enjoy. Uh, so uh, in case anybody has a question, please raise your hand, and we will have mic with you, and uh, we're happy to take that. Otherwise, uh, we will uh, let the organizers invite the next panel. So I think we had great fun. So thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thank you thanks. Thank thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone in the room. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We have reached towards the end of the conference and I think I speak for everybody that uh, it was a really in insightful event. I would, uh, I would now like to invite Dr. James J. Nedumpara, who heads CTIL at the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade to give his special address. Along with him, I would also like to invite Dr. Samil Kaul, Samir Kaul, Senior Consultant, Surgical Oncology and Robotics at Apollo Cancer Institute. I would like to, to request Dr. S. B. Mitra and Dr. Ashok Sharma, sir, to join us on the to the forum.
So, Dr. Ashok Sharma um, of the Federation of Indian Corporate Lawyers, uh, other distinguished uh, uh, speakers and lawyers present in this meeting, uh, friends and colleagues. So, it is uh, a special honor for me to address this meeting uh, at the very fag end of this uh, very rich and extremely useful and instructive deliberation. Uh, I'm not actually a corporate lawyer. I used to be a corporate lawyer a long time ago. Then I, then I became a professor. I joined uh, General Law School and then I'm currently heading the Center for Trade and Investment Law, which is a think tank and an advisory center started by the Department of Commerce to advise the government with respect to international trade negotiations and international investment matters. But one important area which I have or I had the opportunity to work on was the liberalization of the legal profession. And this matter, if you really look at this issue, the liberalization of the legal services has been under discussion for nearly two and a, 25 years, for two and a half decades. When the WTO came into force in 1995, many people thought that our sector, the legal services sector would be completely overhauled and changed. And I still remember way back in 2003, some of the, I think, uh, some of the prophets actually mentioned that the foreign law firms are coming to India. And some of us are also familiar with respect to some of the cases. So there was a very old case called the Lawyers Collective case, which was filed uh, against three English law firms almost two decades ago. So there was some kind of a discussion with respect to the entry of lawyers in India. But that discussion has never made any kind of a significant progress. And now we have come to 2022. At a time when India is actually engaging in a number of free trade agreement negotiations. Most of you have read the fact that India has got negotiations with the United Kingdom. India has already negotiated an agreement with uh, a comprehensive economic partnership agreement with Australia. Uh, in recent times, in January this year, we signed one with the UAE. Obviously, it is not a service economy to that extent. But our negotiations with the United Kingdom in particular, followed by the one with the European Union and, of course, Canada, have actually thrown up a number of interesting issues. Are we at the right time to discuss this matter? Because the one major challenge is that when we think about liberalization, any legal profession, or any service profession for that matter. We have to really look at the state of the profession in the country. We say that the legal profession is a very old profession. It is a noble profession. But we know, we, we completely understand the changes the profession has undergone in the recent times. Now we live in the domain of transnational law, where, country, where companies, entities, business organizations, other kind of uh, even educational organizations, individuals, are entering into, entering into multiple or you can say multifaceted transactions with each other. So the importance of transnational law has really become important in recent times. And when transnational law is a part of our lives, then of course the legal profession comes into, into discussion and into focus. So when we think about you know, all these developments, perhaps it is the right time to think about this matter. But when we uh, discuss uh, the legal profession, I, can, I reckon that the most important constituent, which is actually the practicing lawyers or the so-called litigators, they are by and large absent in this room. And a very important component that is actually the corporate legal sector, which is at the very end, uh, very I think at the leading ed edge of this uh, discussion, is very much part of uh, you know, this debate. So we know that this profession is going through a significant amount of uh, churn, significant amount of uh, evolution. There is no real effort to understand the direction in which the sector is moving. So to come back to that issue about, uh, about uh, le the legal services, the one thing we have to remember is that any kind of a liberalization will have to be a homegrown liberalization. So when we think about the financial services, or legal services or accounting or even any of the professional services, the reform has to actually start at home. Uh, in the context of India, especially in the context of uh, the litigating profession, we are actually governed by the Advocates Act, the 1961 Advocates Act. 
And the Advocates Act has got a very interesting term called practice of law. Nobody really understands the meaning of the term practice of law. If the liberalization is purely limited to opening up the sector in transactions, I mentioned about the in, in transactional law, or maybe in corporate law practice for that matter, the amount of hostility and animosity would have been far less. And I think it is, a, it is, it is actually a tragedy of sorts in the sense that the one area of the legal profession which is perhaps going to be untouched by any kind of a liberalization is actually the most hostile to it. So that is why you know a, a, a very composed, calm and organized thinking is actually required in order to in order to unleash the potential of this particular profession. Let me also tell you that India, the, if you look at the, the value of this profession or you can say the size of the profession, it is around $780 billion. We have to really ask this question. In India, what is actually the size of the profession? What is the size of earning in this area? Is anyone keep keeping any account of it? Uh, one professor, the National Law School uh, of India Vice Chancellor, Professor Mitra did a study way back, I think almost 10, 15 years ago, that was purely based upon some RBA remittance. But the reality is that nobody knows the size of the profession in India because this is not a very formalized structure. I think it is very difficult to find out the kind of remittance happening in the sector, the number of transactions happening in the sector. It is happening because of very poor, very poor reporting. And, and obviously, the, you know, the Bar Council of India, which is supposedly the custodian of the profession, doesn't have the wherewithal in order to, in order to undertake a proper assessment of the size and the potential direction in which the sector can evolve in the future. So in that context, we have to think, we have to think about a few issues. One important issue is, if at all we have to think about liberalization of the legal profession. One important area, as I mentioned earlier, is definitely the corporate legal profession. When we think about the corporate legal profession, obviously, it actually includes a number of law firms practicing corporate law or transactional law for that matter. Underneath that sector, or maybe I would say an adjunct to the sector is basically the general counsel or you can say the corporate lawyers. In India, again, by virtue of you know, some kind of a provision in the Indian Advocates Act, once you take up an employment in a, in, a, in, a, in a firm or in an entity, then you're considered to be an employee and you are de facto out of the profession. That is again, I think, not in line with the best international practices. If you look at the new Kravath model of, uh, I think, uh, reform happening in the profession, there is a seamless movement of lawyers, corporate lawyers going into, into practice and people in practice getting into corporate, in, into the GC po positions. That practice has been well documented. But unfortunately, in India, once you get into the general counsel category, you are isolated and separated. And that is why, you know, this important sector is, is uh, unable to be reformed because of the artificial distinctions. So this is one particular area we have to think about. Let me come up with certain suggestions actually. I spoke about trade agreements. In the context of trade agreements, there is unlimited amount of possibilities. So when I think about possibilities, the legal service sector is not actually a monolithic thing. When we think about the concept of law, there are different categories of law. You can actually call domestic law, you can call third country law, you can call international law. You can actually talk about uh, you know, advisory practices, consulting practices, litigation practices, so many other things. So when you really think about the legal profession, it can be broken down into different slices. And the reform can be in one of the slices. So when we think about the entirety of the legal profession, generally people talk, talk about what you actually call as the litigating sector. But there are very important sectors like the general counsel sector, the corporate legal profession, uh, maybe even the LPO sector for that matter, where India can, you know, India can benefit out of liberalization. So somehow there's a huge amount of fear psychosis, assuming that once, once the, the sector is opened up, then there will be a floodgate of foreign law firms <coughs> coming into the country. And some people believe that the cream or the work will be taken away from the domestic law firms and they will be crippled and significantly depleted of their strength. That, there is some kind of a merit in that argument as well. But any kind of a liberalization has to be sequenced liberalization. So when we think about a sequenced liberalization, we have to identify that sector which has to be properly revamped and, and um, uh, which has to be renovated or modified for that matter. So if you look at the trade agreements, 
perhaps we need to have much more focused discussion and debate as to what should happen, as to which area should go for reform, uh, which area is basically good for uh, India's interest. Perhaps we can completely isolate or provide a safe harbor for the litigation sector. And once we actually do that, then the, this kind of opposition to trade liberalization can be lessened to an extent. But in order, in order to carry out these kind of reforms, we need to have certain kind of critical mass. And organizations like, uh, you know, uh, this one can actually help in terms of mobilizing support for uh, revamping the sector. I would also like to say that um, uh, in India at this moment, there is a significant amount of confusion and lack of clarity as well. So traditionally in the context of international trade, there are three categories or four categories of services. One is actually the transborder uh, provision of services. A lawyer in India providing a service to a particular client maybe in another country. That is actually cross-border service. The second is consumption abroad. A, a person, actually uh, a consumer is going to another country to receive a service. The third category is a commercial persons going to a third country and setting up a law firm for that matter. And then the last category is a lawyer traveling to another country to provide services. In India, based upon the Balaji decision, the Supreme Court decision in AK Balaji, certain amount of opening up in a de facto way is actually happening. In the sense that a certain kind of a casual visit to a foreign country is possible. So, but again, that is not regulated properly. What is actually the meaning of the term casual? Does it depend upon the number of stamps you get on your passport? Nobody knows about it. So if you really want to reform the sector, you need to, under, you need to actually identify uh, you know, the frequency of visit, the number of times a lawyer can uh, come to India and provide the services, what is the duration of service, etc. So in that area, we need to have some kind of a, a discussion. The second important point is that uh, uh, some of the newer areas are completely unregulated. Perhaps you can argue that you know, lack of regulation is actually good for the sector. But lack of regulation also implies something. Lack of regulation basically means that the sector is unrecognized. So if you, look, if you ask me whether the category of general counsel or corporate in-house lawyer is basically recognized in India, the answer is obvious. It is not recognized because uh, it is recognized as an employee. And if you're an employee, you have to basically suspend your practice. And that is not the way the profession can actually move forward. We need, to, we need to understand the potential of the profession. We need to understand the fact that India produces the maximum number of lawyers. And obviously, you know, the size is big, but at the same time, there is sheer volume of good lawyers as well. A number of lawyers in India, they can go to any jurisdiction and practice law for that matter. So if you're not regulating the sector, not thinking about this kind of reforms, we are also missing out something. And missing out on a very important sector may not be always good for India. So I'm not trying to advocate that India should try to liberalize the legal profession in the, in the, in the context of the four FTA negotiations. But I'm trying to say that at least some, some kind of a, you know, some kind of a push has to come from somewhere. And there is no better community than the corporate lawyers who can actually think about this kind of a reform. So thanks again for uh, being part of this particular, uh, you know, meeting. I, I couldn't actually attend uh, all the sessions, but uh, in fact, uh, one of my colleagues is actually sitting here and I hope that I can learn a few things from his notes as well. So thanks again to uh, Dr. Ashok and um, also to the Federation of Indian Corporate Lawyers for organizing such a wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. James, for your very candid thoughts. Uh, now, may I request uh, Dr. Samir Kaul to give his presentation. Uh, just to add, uh, Dr. Samir Kaul uh, support has a foundation, BCPF, uh, the Cancer Foundation, and uh, as a part of our CSR and initiative, FICL supports this, that this fund foundation of Dr. Call. Good evening. Um, can I just request the organizers to just dim those lights a little bit because I've got something to show them as I go along. 
and there's a request for the seniors who are sitting at the back. I want to look into their eyes. So if, without sounding arrogant, if they could move a bit forward, then then no matter what happens. I mean, I don't want to push anybody, but this is my request. Hai. First of all, let me just thank the organizers of the first corporate legal luminaries summit that is being held here. Dr. Mitra, Dr. Jain, Gen Dr. Sharma, gentlemen on the dais, and legal consultants and luminaries before me, I know, I'm aware that you've had a tiring day. Most of you have been in and out, but there have been people who have probably been part of the proceedings through the day. So I'm just going to... First of all, the thing is, what is a doctor or what is a cancer doctor doing amongst legal guys and talking about something that people do not want to confront on a, on a normal basis, cancer, death. These are unkind things. These are very, very unkind things that people don't want to confront because they, they create negative and unpleasant memories. Kushi, for anything to happen, even this event and my little talk here, I'll keep it very short and concise, but even for this talk to occur, there has to be a reason. Reason to actually ye hai ke ये लोग मेरे प्यारे हैं और इन्होंने मुझे आग्रह किया बुलाया अपने पहले फंक्शन में एंड आई लाइक टू कम एंड आई वांटेड टू बी हियर बट दैट कांट बी अ रीजन एंड एंड यू माइट वांट टू लुक फॉर अ बेटर रीजन बिकॉज़ आप लोग कॉर्पोरेट लॉयर्स हैं हर एक चीज का एक लीगल और एक प्रॉपर्ली जस्टिफाइबल रीजन ढूंढने की आदत है आपके माइंड को तो मेरे दिमाग में तो दो ही चीजें कि मैं यहां क्यों हूं पहले मैं अपनी बात करूं व्हाई एम आई हियर आई एम हियर बिकॉज़ I love when something is born, when anything is given birth in this universe, it's tremendous opportunity up ahead. Nay cheese, nay foundation, nay federation, nay movement, naya agra. There may be, I'm sure there would be other organizations of corporate lawyers and other lawyers, but if there is something and somebody has made an attempt to create a new body where people will come together, exchange thoughts, there will be camaraderie, there will be positive thoughts exchanged, there will be mutual learning from each other and people will, and it's not going to be all that easy. It needs to be nurtured because I've also been part of this stuff in the past. It needs to be nurtured against all odds. Like in, then an institution or a body or a, a breathing body will be formed which will serve a purpose which will be positive. It won't be negative. So anything like that needs to be celebrated. So I'm here with this celebration. For, that is the first reason when I am here. And the other reason, you know, you have to do enough mad things in life. You know, being an oncology surgeon for most of my life, 30, 35 years of treating cancers amongst children, amongst old ladies, amongst all sections of the population, various cancers. I've almost, after 35 years, become an agony aunt. The, the telephone calls, the messages, the requests, the talks that I have even in social functions are related to somebody suffering or dying or pain or not enough money for treatment or what should we do. It got caught late and things like that. So I've spent literally a, a major chunk of my life answering these questions and and I have, unfortunately, I must admit, I have a basic human fault in my personality. I tend to wade across the other side of the table. Table ke is par rehne mein koi problem nahi hai. Aapne likha, saamne wale ne suna, and out walks the patient, and you go back, do your own thing, collect your monies. But I have... I have a bit of a problem. I tend to wade across the table very frequently because these people who come, they have not, 
it's just not the, it's probably the worst part of a family when somebody suffers from the cancer worst economically socially psychologically in every way us family ka tana bana sabse chhota wala jo construct hai samne aa jata hai because i think it's a stressful situation when you die you die if you die a sudden death you die immediately but if you die or or you are you think that you will probably die at some time in the future you don't know and the family thinks it becomes I mean, everything changes for that family and i'm telling you not just because being a doctor who's treated cancer patients i'm telling you probably being someone whose own kith and kin maybe my parent somebody died and i was on the other side of the table so i for the rest of my life try to deconstruct and and try to 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 make that balance but today just today you have to do enough mad things in life 35 saal is cheez ko karte karte there is a natural tendency you've got to balance out to maintain your sanity and my way of doing it is to do enough mad things don't get me wrong but talking to corporate lawyers this evening is another of those mad things but having said that i just thought that this may be another important reason why we are here together whether you like it or not is that we are both apart from being you being a corporate lawyer and a legal luminary and a legal consultant with knowledge of legal and law and what can be done with it for good hopefully and me having the knowledge of trying to treat disability this ailment this is but we have a larger role we are part of a society part of a community part of this nation part of a larger people the larger family we have a role to play we have responsibilities on us hamara daitva hai aur wo daitva ye hai that you and me both are opinion builders in the society amongst a society where people don't know half as much or even quarter as much so we have a role we have to help and guide positive decisions in the community around us so today very very briefly i'll try to deconstruct what's happened what is what is cancer what's the situation particularly in our country i think there must i mean i don't know how many of us are here but distant relatives neighbors son in law because we all get involved we are a very very different society compared to the west i lived both places so i know here everybody even the dhobi who comes to the house is interested in what's happening to your son in law maybe even take part in your life maybe bring they bring up our children they you know it's a it's a it's a, we live life a bit differently still in this country it's changing in its urban areas but by and large there is a larger cooperation in the society i just want to bring certain facts about cancer and i'll do it very quickly and very briefly so just to give you an idea of what the burden is like it's a huge thing there are the numbers the numbers are all there i'm not going to repeat them in 2030 there is going to be something like a tsunami something like an epidemic not not nearly as much as a pandemic that you saw with the covid but nearly so it's a lifestyle disease and it has in the mortality in india is front of you lakhs and lakhs of people dying most of them die a good chunk of them die and this another reason why do they why do they die and of course what is what is our response the first thing that happen in any society before you think of a law or a plan or a response an organized response is what is the magnitude of the problem kitna hai we woke up late to recording in this part of the world or jo recording hamare paas reh gayi bura nahi manna it's from the british times only hum log ladte hain aajkal bolte hain ki bhai hamare paas apni sabhyata mein bahut kuch tha i'm sure tha history bhi thi but recording aur map making usme nahi thi aaj bhi hamari jo national cancer registry hai ye 10% to official figure hai isse kam penetration hai क्या कितने कैंसर केसेस एक्चुअली इस कंट्री में हैं वो हमें पता ही नहीं है सच मानो तो रियली हम वी क्लेम दैट वी नो इट वी हैव फिगर्स बट देर इज जस्ट द टिप ऑफ द आइसबर्ग बिकॉज आई डील विद इट आई कैन टेल यू नाउ हिस्ट्री कैंसर की तो बड़ी पुरानी वाइल फ्रॉम देयर इट स्टार्टेड ऑल हेयर आई एम अ कैंसर सर्जन सो लेट मी गिव यू एन आइडिया अबाउट वॉट हैज चेंज 
in this cancer and its treatment over the years. Now, what you see in front of you is how cancer was treated. This cancer ka ilaj ho raha, operation ho raha, bahut saal pehle. Ye, ye, ye sabse earliest mentioned Edwin Smith, wo papyrus jo uh, Egypt ka tha, usme likhe hoye mila. कि भाई ये ऐसे करके हम लोग कैंसर के ऑपरेशन करते थे हमारे यहाँ भी था आई टेल यू अबिट अबाउट सुश्रूत लेटर बट दिस दिस आर रिकॉर्डेड वंस उसके बाद एक्चुअल जो मॉडर्न कैंसर सर्जरी द रियल कैंसर सर्जरी दैट वी डू टुडे वी कॉल आस इज स्टार्टेड समथिंग इन 1800s लार्ज ओवेरियन ओवरी का ट्यूमर कहीं फ्रंटर अमेरिका में निकाला गया बट उसके बाद काफ़ी कुछ हुआ दिस थियोडोर बिलरॉथ आई डोंट नो हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू विजिटेड वियाना अगर मौका मिले तो प्लीज जाइएगा बिकॉज इट्स अ ब्यूटिफुल सिटी वन ऑफ द मोस्ट ओरिजिनल सिटीज इन यूरोप द रियल एडवांसमेंट्स इन मेडिसिन have come in those cobbled streets of Vienna. That is where Theodore Bilroth, the first guy who did a major cancer surgery in the world, lived. And that night, his house was burned down because the patient died. He had some stomach cancer. He operated on a stomach cancer patient who died in the middle of the night. Vienna people burned his house down. But after that, on the same day, actually, it started. प्रॉपर कैंसर सर्जरी की उसके बाद हमने मॉडिफिकेशंस किए बट नॉट अ लॉट बेसिक स्ट्रट वही था उसके बाद विलियम स्टूअर्ट हेल्स्टेड द फर्स्ट प्रोफेसर ऑफ कैंसर सर्जरी एट द इन बैल्टिमोर इन यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ही यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स डिंट हैव एनी ओरिजिनल training or thinking it's a it's an immigrant society they all trained in europe because that is where it all happened the first medical people who are good named physicians who we follow even today even on our ward rounds our youngsters hear their quotes and all is all europe and they were all trained so william halstead was among the first people who got trained for big surgeries and operations for cancer breast ki surgery us gloves wagaira sab usi ke naam se jane jate hain halstead and he got trained in europe under professor langenbeck in switzerland bern germany vienna in countries mein original thought hungary these were the original thought and advancements were so ye while i am telling you the story i am telling you where i come from aajkal khair aisa nahi hai zyada uh, conflict wala area hai but khoobsurat zarur hai another major revolution came with this guy this guy has actually been my idol his name is umberto veronese milan cancer institute italy ka director bhi tha he rose to become the health minister of italy but he he resigned after a year he said i just wanted to he just wanted to prove a point but more important than that he started the first conservative conserving breasts today also breasts or any other organs which catch a cancer has, are sacrificed uniformly but he's the guy who proved that you could still save this person if you did less than sacrificing the whole organ it made you don't know how much of a difference it makes when you remove the whole organ or you remove only the cancerous part and yet the results are the same so who was the guy who was credited because you know today if you've got to have the world follow a particular method of treatment it has to have enough evidence people look for scientific evidence beyond doubt research which has to prove that this is the right way to do not just anecdotal evidences here and there i do it like this and i do it like that no there have to be enough people it has to be proven across enough cohorts for it to be followed and he's the guy who started all that so that's why i show his face uske baad aaj ki baat bata raha hu aapko enough there are now so many advances whether it's radio frequency ablation the capnopen device linux robotics chemo port hypec lots of newer and newer procedures now not radical some of them radical some of them minimalistic do less and less and less and save the patient nevertheless so lot of targeted chemotherapy which means take only the therapeutic drugs which which kill the cancer cells don't affect the normal cells why do people why do you have uh, news and your mind made up about people taking chemotherapies losing their hair vomiting incessantly all kinds of weakness can't even walk 
that used to happen with routine chemotherapy because it would it would work against all actively dividing cells in the body whether it was the inner lining of the gastrointestinal tract whether it was the hair cells whether it was the sperms or the ovarian cells not anymore now you find out mutations in it it's almost almost nearly i'm not saying completely because we are there we've just entered the door of genomics and mutation it's like a culture sensitivity test that you do for a urine peshab ka test karate hain usme pata batta kaun sa antibiotic use karna hai wo batati hai aaj tumors aur cancers ke sath bhi almost hum us sthiti pe hain little bit more and we will enter the door and it will tell you exactly what drug to use and it won't work on the other cells it will just work on those cancer cells so no side effects precision radiotherapy now this what i'm showing you now is the only proton beam therapy this part of the world beyond singapore it's in it's in chennai with the apollo group but 600 million it costs but it delivers precision radiation treatment to millimeters does not scatter no matter you may have a tumor in a eyeball in a particular area or in a young child in a part of a brain that you don't want any extra rays to be given all right today we can do that because we have got technology come to our rescue and it has it hasn't failed us it has today i can't even believe it the way things are changing almost every other day if i didn't have a connect to the us fda and the eurtc on my cell phones and thank god for the technology that we have an information technology we are abreast with what's happening and and it is changing so fast robotics who is going to get operated i think a few years down the line with you know open surgeries are really going to become a thing of the past jaise maine aapko wo edwin smith papyrus ki slide dikhai egypt mein aisa karte the so shrut saab baithte the sab logon ko milke fir wo operation karte the ab wo wo to bilkul purani baat ho ho gayi hai aaj ki date mein bhi and a few years down the line even more so ladies and gentlemen today is robotics minimal cuts minimal surgery minimal pain minimum time in the operation minimal trauma like this this is a pacemaker for cancer patients very small device that we put in about 15 minutes under the skin hair that is where you give your chemotherapy through today not through black and blue bruises in your arms and make it a horrible experience today it's about pleasant treatment journey even if you have cancer it should be a pleasant treatment journey for you that's where our efforts are concentrated that's what we'd like to do that's where we may not have completely succeeded but i can tell you we are on the right path and right road this is the toll way to cancer treatment today the chemo port it takes 15 minutes to put and we are out of it why are we making such a huge cry about please diagnose early please go for your checkups in time please do it why why what may because 50% of newly detected cancer cases are even today in an advanced stage but the good news is that few years back just 7 8 years back 65 to 70% cancer cases detected in india were in stage 3 and 4 so all you did was just try and do an exercise spend money get on getting operated and and get no results at all or you know and and let the whole patient and its family and the whole ecosystem go through that angst and agony but today that's changing we are looking at cancers early and we are treating them with better results resulting in poor outcome poor quality of life and financial burden to the family and nation at diagnosis why because by the time you diagnose an advanced cancer 90% of its life history and its journey is already over uske baad to 10% hai so what you do is just going to make a change in that 10% not a not a not a large difference so costs of cancer care abhi tak to maine aapko achhi cheeze batayi it's a human tendency jab jab baat karni hoti hai achhi cheez bhi hai because when you talk about a glass to pehle baat kijiye ki half full hai kitna khali hai uski baat hum ab karne khali isliye hai kyunki the costs of cancer treatment ladies and gentlemen are really really accelerating and they are really really of concern why let me give you an idea 
or not only in India, in the most advanced countries in the world, even in America, if that were not true, why would every president come with Obama care, Clinton care, this care? Because, because none of them works adequately. They fight presidential elections on medical you know, uh, systems because there is even in the most developed and rich countries of the world, there is never enough money to treat these patients. And by the way, cancer is the single most reason worldwide for personal bankruptcy, ladies and gentlemen. When somebody goes kaput and bankrupt in anywhere in the world, even if it be Canada and America or North America, it is cancer treatment, out of pocket cancer treatment. Why? Because and now imagine the trauma in a country. We get classified as a lower income group country by the WHO. But Mera Swabiman hai bhai. So I would like to call myself a transitioning country. Bura nahi hai. I am transitioning. There is a feel good factor we have all tried to generate. We are transitioning from the lower income group to the middle income group country. I don't know whether that is correct, but that's what I would like to believe. And even if that be so, the maximum impact and the maximum challenges are for us because it hits us more. We are deficient in every quarter, not only in the in the quantity of money available for treatment. We are deficient in our strategies. We are deficient in our distribution of strategy, distribution of healthcare delivery. We are there are imbalances, and these cannot be in isolation because ultimately a country and a people rise as a whole. So, if there is economic, judicial, social heterogeneity or diversity. It impacts everything, health, education, and whatever you may like to talk about. So the cancer value, unnecessary interventions, especially at the end of life, when there is nothing much to be gained over treatment, if you would like, is also one of the problems which need to integrate. You keep on doing, just for other self-satisfaction, just because it's an unkind thing to tell a family that really you're not going to achieve anything much, you keep on spending their money, they sell their houses, they, 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 they mortgage their jewels. For what? For nothing. Three months, for six months down the line, it's something else. There is a disconnect between the value and the technology adoption. And of course, inefficient cancer care delivery system. We can't fail. Can we? Why? Because the consequences of failure are tremendous. There are Less than 19% of this country has a health insurance. While I say this with disdain, on, there is a positive side also. Because if only 19% percent hai, to karne ka hai. That is potential. As opposed to countries where all that is done. So imagine the potential because it can't be done without that. Health insurance needs to penetrate our systems, of course, it has to be appropriate products, appropriate to the communities that they address, have to be designed. This lack of development of these appropriate products in our country, I'm sure it will happen. Like I said, I say that we are transitioning country. It's happening. Or I'm positive, so hoga, I'm sure it'll take longer. Of course, we made the swanky airports after we made people sl sleep on the floors for ten, four, seven or ten years, whatever it took. Hum kar lete hain. We just take longer doing it. We're on the right, as long as we're on the right track. So, uneven excess, everything concentrated in one place. Phir meelon tak kuch nahi. Palwal se aage chale jao. Story is different. Where is here? Swanky hospitals in half a kilometer down the road, many of them, not just one. So uneven excess, not an easy thing to do, but I tried to be positive about whatever is happening with this word cancer. So not a really a death sentence anymore. Let me just share to you that in a routine OPD, there was a time when everybody coming would say that Jao ghar, pehle to log bhejta hi nahi the treatment karne ke liye, mar jaya, kya paise kach karenge? Ya naam hi nahi pata hota tha, people would die six years. Ab now people are living more, so the cancers and diseases of old age have gotten added. 
So when they've gotten added, the numbers have risen. Today, there's a name to the disease. You can say this guy is dying of this as opposed to you not knowing 20 years back what they're dying of. Uh, 67, 68, 17. It could be tuberculosis. It could be anything. Today, there's a name to it. People talk about it. They write about it. We know about it. We ask questions. And that's positive. So, kuch baatein achhi, kuch baatein buri. So, aaj ki raat, dosto, itna hi. Thank you very much. Good night. <coughs> Respected Dr. James, Dr. Call, Dr. Sharma on the dais, my friends and colleagues from the legal fraternity of the dais, after this passionate speech by Dr. Call, there is no scope for any more statement from our side. I tend to become emotional because my elder brother and my niece, the daughter of my elder brother, both of them died out of cancer. And we have passed through the trauma as a member of the family. Anyway, <coughs> now is the time for acknowledgement. Whole day is over. All technical sessions have gone off very well. We are thankful to sponsors and also the organizations nominating the delegates. We are thankful to delegates for their participation and enthusiastic Queries made before the expert panelists. We are <coughs> thankful to the eminent members of the National Advisory Committee to this FICL for their guidance to conduct this program. We are thankful to the hotel, the Taj Hotel, and particularly Mr. Rajendra Mishra, the general counsel of Taj Group, for extending such a wonderful, you know, support to all of us. He could not personally come over, but he has deputed two of his colleagues to make sure that everything goes off well. We are thankful to you, Mr. Rajendra Mishra. We are also thankful to the organizing body. And I am need to make, make mention of two persons. One is Rohan and second is Gurmit. Without their support, probably this program could not have become successful. I don't want to speak much about Dr. Sharma because he is the force behind in organizing this event. But it's a maddening beginning. And I'm sure this institution will go a long way. It will grow by lifts and bounds with the support of the Members, the membership change has already crossed. I am told around 1400 or 1300 or so. But organizing event could be one of the activities to be carried out by the FICL. Because anything you do, you need money, you need sponsorship, you need, I mean, the participation fees, so on and so forth. But the whole idea to form this platform is to promote the interest of the in-house corporate council. And that makes sense that if we can get ourselves engaged in knowledge sharing and also 
help in creating an environment for policy advocacy. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be here. Lastly, I am also grateful to Mr. Meheria, MCO group for providing us the MC. And I, on behalf of FICN, express our sincere thanks to everyone who have actively participated and who have worked behind the scene. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Right, friends? So, as they say in French, au revoir. So long till we meet again. Uh, now, uh, let's go for some drinks and uh, some food. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.